Hey guys, so how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors. I hope you're having an awesome day. So, I'm at the Bushcraft Show 2014 in the Midlands part of the United Kingdom, uh, and I'm here with Ben Horford. Ben, how Hi. are you doing? I'm very good, man. A excellent stuff. Sun's shining now, anyway. <laughs> I know, I know, man. It's, just to give you a quick backdrop, um, this is a spin off video from the main Bushcraft Show video that I've done. Um, we've been affected quite badly with the weather, and this is the um, the, the kind of Sunday where you know all of a sudden we've got we've got some blue skies so we're making the most of it yeah. uh, to get out and do some filming. Um, I set the intention with doing um, well hopefully you know, Ben had the time to do a video from before. Um, and he's very very kindly taking the time out. Um, so you're probably thinking like well you know who's Ben Orford for some of you that may not know. So Ben firstly thank you for taking the time out no problem, man. to do the video. So for those of you that you know the, that are watching the video that don't know about you and what you do, yeah. would you care to explain? Wow, who am I? What am I? Um, my name's Ben, I'm from Herefordshire. I started off uh, leaving school and going into a traditional green woodworking, chair making, working in the woods apprenticeship. Uh, so that's where I started off. Just loved being outdoors and it was the kind of the thing that I could find that was closely linked to bushcraft but more craft based I suppose. And I was fortunate I found a guy down the road from me. So yeah, 16, 17, started working in the woods, using lots of hand tools, using old fashioned pole aids. Um, lots of the tools that I wanted to use weren't either available or the modern equivalents were very poor quality. Right. So it almost went straight hand in hand that when I started doing the woodworking, that I started making my own tools as well because okay. they just weren't available. Gotcha. Uh, of course, we ran courses in the woods, so we'd have lots of people coming along, learning how to use all the equipment, and a lot of them would turn up with without a pen knife or without a knife at all. Right. So I'd lend them a knife, and they'd be like, "Wow, they'd use it a bit." Oh, where'd you get that from? Oh, well, I made it. Wow, can you make me one? And that's that's how it started. So, gone from a woodworking background about sort of. 15 years ago I suppose and then it slowly progressed so now I mostly make woodworking tools so spoon carving tools, green woodworking tools, draw knives and things but mostly bushcraft knives and, and woodcraft knives that's basically what I'm about. Um, so I make all the tools and then my wife Lois does all the leather work so we make the sheaths obviously for the knives but belts and pouches and things like that. Excellent so, stuff. Yeah. And is it primarily within the UK that you're you're doing your wares or is it are you are you known abroad as well? It used to be word of mouth, like we were rubbish, we never didn't have a website or anything because it was word of mouth and people would say if you need a knife go and speak to Ben. Um, but then it sort of progressed that we finally got a website and mm -hmm. my stepson Bo started doing a few little YouTube videos on yeah. how to how to use the stuff and and then suddenly it's global, you know. So we yeah, we ship stuff all over the world now from it's quite lovely for me, you know, because I'm not a, a, a big traveller really. I've been a few places, but I mostly stay in the UK. But when you're talking to a guy who's talking to you via 3G on his mobile phone in the middle of the bush in Australia, ordering tools because he wants to do green woodworking, it's amazing. It suddenly makes the world this small, you know. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's yeah. a great community. Yeah, the social media has changed a lot of that landscape. It's brilliant. Yeah, um, it really is. So the thing, this is Ben. Ben's. Um, his kind of his work is phenomenal, producing some very very high end tools, uh, like you said, for the different markets. But yeah. as you guys know, I'm, I'm a complete beginner into the bushcraft space, um, and your your name was something I heard quite regularly mentioned oh. when it came to because I came went to a spoon carving course, right? Uh, and straight away your your name was mentioned, right? You know, um, and so this is probably going to some of you probably know Ben and experience, probably thinking, what is that? What you're going to focus on talking to Ben, <laughs> right? But my thing is because I'm a beginner, you know, I want to start off with the basics. Uh, and as I know you can testify way more than I can, once you master the basics, um, then obviously it's a, it's a transition from there yeah. into the real kind of like intricacies yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, of knife handling and, and, and etc. So my suggestion was, uh, speaking to Ben, and is this, okay, the Moron knife. So this is my, my knife that I'm using at the moment and I'm going to be using it for a while. Um, and obviously, you know, you've got the care, the maintenance, etc. Yep. Um, and we were just speaking just before we shot this video about you were saying so how it's, it's a very common knife yep. uh, for the beginner. And was this were you saying that you started off with a? I one of the first knives I got because obviously when I first started woodworking, there wasn't it wasn't that common to find knives with the Scandi grind, which is right. obviously primarily for a woodcraft and bushcraft. The Scandi grind is what you're looking for. Okay. For ease of sharpening you know, and for for control when you're whittling and carving. Just, just, just one quick question, what do you mean by a scan the grind? Can, can I yep, have a sure. look at the knife and we'll, we'll show it. So, uh, a sort of fairly conventional, well I'll tell you what, look, let's, let's pull out a classic sort of 
normal style blade that you get on a, a fairly conventional knife. Okay, this is a, a Leatherman, but the kind of grind that you've got on here is you've got a primary grind and then you've got a very small secondary bevel. Now that's what you will find on nearly every kind of hunting knife, pocket knife, knife Swiss Army knife. And that's like a, a general purpose knife for cutting string, opening bags and things. Now the trouble with that very narrow bevel is it means you get very little response when you're trying to carve with it. Okay. And when it comes to sharpening, there's so little response from the stone, it's yeah. very difficult to get that get that angle correct. Gotcha. So the Scandi grind is the difference between a knife and almost a woodworking tool or a chisel because you've got these two very pronounced wide flat bevels which meet at one point and it means that you've got a knife that you can lay on a piece of wood and tilt and control and get very fine cuts or very heavy cuts. Okay. So it's almost like a woodworking tool really. Um, obviously this has come from Scandinavia tradition mm -hmm. so that we tend to nickname it the Scandi grind because okay. it's on Norwegian knives and things but if you're starting out in bushcraft or woodcraft I would suggest getting this kind of grind over a hollow grind or a sabre grind or anything because you're going to find this a lot more controllable to use Okay. but also when it comes to the sharpening side of things it's going to be a lot easier Gotcha. Yeah. so that's, that's the Scandi grind but the more you'll see everywhere now because a lot of bushcraft schools will almost give you one of these when you mm -hmm. attend your first course they can start off from about sort of 10 11 pounds so they're affordable um, yes people don't sort of um, hold them at high esteem I suppose because they're composite handles and they're you know a, a composite sheath but to be quite frank for the value for money and for the quality of the tool and for the grip factor and the fact that this is not going to get damaged or cut or, mm -hmm. or waterlogged it's great great value you know yeah. and it's great a great knife to learn on because you're not going to have to fear damaging a, a handcrafted 200 pound knife yeah. when you're learning and that, and the fear factor can sometimes be a thing that stops you wanting to learn you yeah. know you don't want to damage your knife by sharpening it right because what what inspired me to get it was actually uh, Paul Kirtley he'd done a blog post about the best bushcraft knife for beginners yeah um, and it was exactly that what was mentioning and it, and it, it just sounded complete common sense to yeah, me yeah. that I'll, I'll go ahead and buy a 150 pound knife and um, because I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. A, I want to really appreciate having a 150 yeah. pound knife. Yeah. Uh, and also, like you said, you know, very, very easily. Well, uh, it's a bit like uh, if you're learning to drive, you yeah. wouldn't go out and buy a Ferrari. Yeah. You'd buy a second-hand car and it wouldn't matter if you bash it into a few, uh, yeah. uh, few walls. <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> a few scratches, it wouldn't no, matter. No, no, that we haven't done that. <laughs> no, <that's it. laughs> but, uh, and this is like, uh, I'm not saying that even our most competent, professional, well, look at Cody, you know, yeah. Cody Lundini, Lundini, who's been at the show, he's got a Mora with a traditional wooden red handle and he wears it around his neck and that's all he uses yeah. because he doesn't need any more. So I'm not saying that you progress from this to a very expensive knife just because of your skill level. Yeah. I'm just saying that some people don't like it because it hasn't got the the soul, the, 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 the workmanship, the, 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 the hand craftsman's yeah. input into that. It's, a, it's, it's one of a million other more knives, they're all going to look the same. Yeah. But for learning on, you can't fault it, can you? Excellent yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, if okay with you, what we'll do now, I'll jump behind the camera and uh, we'll get tucked straight in. Yeah. Okay, so here we are at the workstation. Um, so Ben, what's the uh, first thing that we're going to work on in terms of you know, maintenance and sharpening of Amora? Well, what I thought I'd say is obviously you've got nothing to fear about the sheath because obviously it's a composite sheath. The great thing about them is they normally have a hole in the bottom so you haven't got to worry about sort of dirt or debris or even water getting trapped in there because they're going to they're gonna drain. Occasionally you might find that you get a few shavings and stuff in there which you can, you can normally get out by just giving it a tap. So nothing really to think about the sheath as such. Um, the classic thing with a carbon steel knife, which is primarily what people tend to go towards when they're when they're learning, because they're the most common, they're the cheapest sort of steel to, to get in industry really, so you tend to find them commonplace. This is the uh, the robust version, so it's a slightly thicker blade stock, which is good, you know, if you're gonna be battening and things like that with it. The disadvantages with uh, carbon steel is obviously you're going to get corrosion. That's one of the sort of trade-offs. The ease of sharpening of carbon steel is the reason why we use it really, but the corrosion factor is, is a little bit of a nuisance I suppose. But 
obviously this is your sort of beginner's knife so you can learn how to maintain this and then when you do get a more elaborate or a more expensive knife you can use the same techniques to, to look after that as well. So for corrosion on the actual sides of the blade, not that it's an absolute importance but it's nice to make sure that this corrosion doesn't eat deep pits into the steel of the knife so for general maintenance one of my sort of top tips these are a few little gadgets that I've acquired over the over the years and this is a, a, a material called Gary Flex it's a, a rubber block with grit it's effectively a rubber block with impregnated sort of sandy grit in it so rather than using sandpaper to clean this blade you can use these if you use sandpaper to, to clean your knife you'll end up with putting sort of random scratch patterns into the actual blade and it can just look a little bit unsightly. So to clean this, the safest way to do it is to stick it, the tip of the knife into your chopping block or into a log or something and then ideally you want to always want to try and work from behind the cutting edge so if you do slip you're not going to cut your fingers. Assess the scratch pattern. Most knives you'll find the, the scratch pattern from manufacture goes from the handle through to the tip of the blade. So we're going to use this in the same direction and what we do is we just rub this back and forth on the actual blade itself and you can see almost straight away it will remove any tarnish or any rust from the surface of the blade. So that's cleaned up all those marks and obviously if you do this on a regular basis those divots and those pits aren't going to get very deep. Don't worry about cleaning up the bevel because that will get cleaned up when you actually sharpen it and general maintenance. To do the other side there is a bit of a danger that obviously if you're holding it this way that you can slip and cut yourself on the actual cutting edge so you can either swing it round and support it on your forearm and do it this way or do it the same manner but just be really careful that you don't slip. So we'll just clean up that side and just general maintenance like that is always good practice. So that's cleaned up both of those surfaces. If you have got a custom knife and you've got wooden hander scales and obviously you've got a tang that's exposed you can even use this to clean up any rust on the tang and it won't hurt your handle material as well so that's much safer than using uh, sandpaper and things like that. And where is this commonly available? Um... It used to be a bit specialised you could only get them from sort of uh, industrial tool suppliers but a, a great place that I get a lot of my stuff from is Axminster Power Tools and they sell these either individually or they sell them now in a, a tool care package that you get two of these, two different grades. This is the, the medium grade, which is a grey colour, which is about 120 grit. But they do three grades, a blue, which is the coarsest, the, the, the black or the grey, that's the medium, and then they do a beige colour, which is the finest, and they do all three. And they also combine it with these little Camellia oil applicators, which is also good for preventing rust or corrosion. Uh, and they also do it with a, a pot of camellia oil that you can fill up one of these applicators as Excellent. well. So just very quickly, for those that are not in the UK, what would they actually search for in terms of the... Uh... I think they're called something like rubber, rubber abrasive blocks or impregnated rubber blocks. Um, you should be able to find them. They're, they're a bit sort of specialised, but sort of surface, surface cleaning products and things like that. If you can't find that actual specific tool, it sounds crazy, but what you can actually do is if you go into a, a sort of fairly uh, big stationer's, you can normally buy an eraser that's half white for pencil and then half blue that's for rubbing out biro. And that, that blue end is effectively the same material as this Gary Flex, so you could get one of those and it won't last you as long because it's smaller, but obviously it's a lot cheaper. It probably only costs you about £1.50, something Excellent. like that. So, like I say, the, the bevel itself, don't worry about corrosion on that because you can sharpen that when you when you use it normally. We've said about the Scandi grind being the easiest to sharpen because we get a lot of response when we lay that on the stone. Stones is a sort of a bit of a, a minefield when it comes to sharpening. You'll hear some people say you can only use water stones, some people will say you can only use diamond stones. The technique, it doesn't really matter what you're using. But when it comes to sharpening, you've got to think that you're using any kind of abrasive. I use a lot of sandpaper, and you're trying to polish two bevels to them so that they meet in the smallest point possible. So you're aiming for down to one micron, something like that. When it comes to sharpening, with the Scandi grind, when you're trying to learn how to sharpen it, it's I know this isn't a stone, but if we pretend this is my sharpening stone, and you've got the flat surface here, when you lay it onto the surface of your stone and you start you start rubbing it back and forth it's sometimes difficult to actually see where you're removing steel from 
So my sort of top tip is a normal sort of marker pen or a sharpie and then you can actually colour in the bevel and when you start sharpening you will start removing that pen and when you actually look at it if you're removing pen only from the back of the bevel then it means that you're leaning too far back on the stone and if you're only removing it from the front of the bevel it means you're leaning too far forward so you can effectively adjust how you're holding the knife on the stone purely by the indication from the actual pen that you're removing so pen is always a good top tip um, what I normally say to people when it comes to sharpening is don't fear it everybody says all oh, sharpening's hard sharpening's difficult so people put it off and what they'll end up with is they'll leave it for months or if not years and you'll end up with a very flat section and you'll end up with a big wide flat area that's dull and it'll take a hell of a lot of effort and very aggressive stones to get it back so what you want to try and do is little and often so what I actually use nearly more than anything is if I'm whittling and I've sharpened my knife properly on stones and I'm carving with it and I feel that it's just lost that razor edge I'll stop and I'll just strop it now a strop is used just for the finishing stages of sharpening and it will remove any burr and some people will use a flat leather belt and it's unsupported it's sort of wrapped around a branch or something what I tend to use is I use a piece of leather stuck to a board so this is stuck with the fluffy side of the leather uppermost and then we charge it with this material it's called Tormek paste it looks like toothpaste but what it's got in there is very fine little bits of grit and you charge the surface of the leather with the Tormek paste you don't need much only a bit the size of a pea something like that and then what you can do is you can strop your tool so it means if you strop it regularly you're not going to get your hands all dirty with slurry from the the uh, sharpening stone so if you are whittling your your spoon you're not going to get it filthy but what you do is you strop away from the cutting edge never push it into the leather always strop away and that will sometimes be enough to put that razor edge back on your knife so already it started to remove that pen look and you're starting from the base of the, the blade all the way to the top yeah, yeah. it's it, it, I suppose it's just more comfortable and easier to do that like to do this side I'd probably do the, almost the same but in the opposite direction and like obviously stropping if it's too dull that won't make a difference but if you stop when you feel that it's just lost that razor edge a strop will be enough to put it put that edge back on that tool so that's my sort of top tip keep that handy keep your strop handy and do lots of stropping on a regular basis and as soon as you feel that it's it's too dull for the strop to come back then get onto the onto the sharpening stones like I don't know whether you can capture it in your in your camera Z but can you see the the light yes. bouncing back off that cutting edge yes now that any light bouncing back at you is your indicator that there's a flat spot there and the wider that flat spot is and the more light bounces back at you the duller that tool is so if I see a lot of light bouncing back, that tells me that I need to use a, a relatively coarse stone to start with. If I can't see much light back bouncing back at me, but it doesn't feel sharp, then I'll start with a finer stone. So there's no point going to a very coarse stone if you if you don't have to. Um, obviously, if you've been using water as a as a lubrication for your sharpening media, whether you're using Japanese water stones or you're using sandpaper with water on what I would say once you have sharpened it and you've got that good edge prevention is always better than a cure so we've mentioned that camellia oil so this is a traditional Japanese woodworking oil that they apply to all their woodworking tools at the end of the day to prevent moisture and corrosion and what you do is you wipe that on your blade and you can see it just leaves a very thin coating of oil and this is food safe oil so if you are using your knife for food preparation you're not going to worry that you're going to taint your food with like using WD-40 or gun oil and uh, is that on the entire blade that you put that on? I do yeah any exposed metal parts and it won't if you've got a wooden handle it won't matter if, if you get it on, uh, on on the wood because it's it's it'll be fine on that as well so you can rub that on and obviously when you put your knife back in the sheath it's going to hold that oil on that blade and it's going to prevent any corrosion especially with a plastic sheath like this sometimes if you go in from hot to cold you'll get condensation building up on the inside of that sheath and it will prevent any, any any corrosion on there and obviously the rubber handle you don't really have to worry about it if you do get uh, sort of resin or sticky stuff when you're out in the woods on the handle and you want to clean it off 
a little bit of acetone, a little bit of nail varnish remover, something like that, we'll, we'll get it off. It might melt the rubber a bit. Um, WD-40 is very good for cleaning off resin, like if you want to clean resin or something off your off your sheath, that would be, be perfect for it, really. But um, With the leather strop, okay, so what is your advice if someone was to decide to use their belt? Um, the, only, the, only, the only disadvantage with using a, an unsupported piece of leather, so your belt wrapped around a branch or something, is I find when people are learning, if you imagine you've got a very slack piece of leather and you're learning, you there's a tendency of rounding the cutting edge over almost too much because it's unsupported. With this method, sticking it on a board, the leather can only distort by a very set amount. It can only be pressed in by probably half a mil, something like that. So when you're learning to sharpen, you know that you're not going to round over that cutting edge too much. Um, I, person, I personally prefer prefer this method. It's a bit more compact. It's a bit easier. You're not going to round your cutting edge, and you're not going to you're not going to cut your belt in half as well. Um, the only other thing that you can do, like obviously that's going to leave a very good edge. My sort of top tip is for the ultimate edge when you've got it sharp and you just want to make it really razor sharp. Is you can finish it off by getting a piece of newspaper. Ideally, not not too much colour print. The more black print, the better because basically the, the noose print itself is very, very finely abrasive. So if you finish your knife off by stropping it on black noose print, you'll end up with an absolute ultimate edge. You know, it's really, really, really sharp. Uh, and people say, well, why, why does that work? I went, I went into a, a, a Japanese knife uh, uh, shop in, in London and he, he used the same technique and he reckoned it was because the carbon in the noose print and the carbon in the blade of the knife, when you were rubbing it back and forth, it realigned all the molecules. It sounded, it sounded very magical, but I think basically it's just that the, the black ink is just very, very slightly abrasive. Like, I always remember my, my gran, when she finished cleaning her windows, she'd always mm. finish off by rubbing that yeah. down with a bit of newspaper, you know. Nice, yeah. yeah. So that works really good. So that's the, that's the sort of uh, top tip, really. Um, bit of cheap newspaper, and obviously when you've got it sharp, you can you can test to see if it's if it's razor daisy really. Excellent stuff. So in terms of the um, the spine, um, oh, on on the knife, yeah. Yeah, on the uh, spine, because obviously you know we were discussing earlier how to kind of double the use of the actual mora to be able to kind of strike you know, on a fire still. So what's your advice in terms of you know getting that that squared off? Yeah, like it's entirely up to you, like. People have got different techniques. Some people like to use the tip of their knife for, for using for a fire steel. Other people like to have it square and sharp here because they like to use it right next to the uh, handle of the, the knife. Ideally, you can leave it square the whole length of the blade, but if you're learning to carve with it and you've got a very square edge, it's gonna be uncomfortable on your fingers. So I would find out where you prefer to use the striker and just grind one edge. Obviously, if you're right-handed, you're gonna be holding it in your right hand, so you only need to sharpen this opposite side for when you're using the fire steel. It comes fairly rounded when you get it because obviously they've polished it on, on polishing machines. So if you just get a, 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 a file, like if you go into a local agricultural store, they should sell the flat files for chainsaws, for filing chainsaw bars down. And that will be the best file to use to just file that one edge square. Like the, the sort of test that I use, and that's why I was holding it on my thumbnail, it wants to be sharp enough so that it can actually scrape your nail on your thumb. Um, at the moment you can see it's not it's not moving anything um, so like if I compare it to my, my my knife that I've got a nice square back edge on I can actually scrape you can see it's actually scraping my, my, my thumbnail and that's basically what you want you want to be able to actually shear or shave the actual fire steel itself so it needs to be it needs to be that sharp really it seems extreme but that's that's what you need really Excellent stuff. So in terms of the practicalities of someone going outside, let's say I want to keep my kit absolutely minimal. Yeah. Um, what are the absolute basic, basic, basic bits of kit that you would take to kind of maintain the, the edge on your, on your mora? If I was going to just carry something so I could just literally maintain the edge while I was out and about, um, I've got a smaller version of this that I carry. It's, it's made from a piece of, I don't know, it's about... It's about an inch and a half wide. It's about eight mil thick. It's almost like a scrap piece of wood that I got out of a skip of a joiner's. And what I've got is I've got a piece of wet and dry sandpaper wrapped around it. If you wanted to, you could stick uh, a piece of wet and dry sandpaper on one side of the wood 
and then you could stick a piece of leather some honing paste on the other side stick it in a little plastic bag and you can slide that it wants to be at least at least 12 inches long something like that but you can put that in a plastic bag and slide that on in, in, your, in your rucksack it's really light you can sharpen your knife on it you're not going to break it if you lose it you're not going to cry because it's only a bit of, a bit of sandpaper really rather than carrying a little pocket stone or a, or a little puck or something which you can't really hold anyway so a stick with a bit of lightweight cheap sandpaper will, will do a real good trick there. excellent and i've been hearing about in terms of advice of, of putting oil on it that you can put you know olive oil and so forth i mean what, what is your advice in terms of on your knife blade itself like I, ideally if you if you can get camellia oil then that's great but any, any oil will work so olive oil if you've got a little pot of olive oil or something that you're taking because you're cooking then you can apply that to the blade that will prevent any corrosion obviously think about it if you're going to put gun oil on it and then you're going to use it for food preparation that's not going to be good news so if you can use food safe oil it's a it's a safer way to be really hey guys so uh ben Alford, i want to thank you so much no worries, man. for taking the time out um i'm sure you found it useful i know i found it useful i learned a lot of tips here I think the newspaper one was a really cool idea. Yeah, it's good, it's cheap. I thought, what's yeah. good? Am I that boring? Is going to start reading in the middle of the thing? <laughs> Who'd have thought? But no, seriously, thank you so much for, not problem, for taking the time out. I know um, it's, it's going to help me out. Hopefully, it'll help a lot of you out. Um, if people want to find out more about the work that you do and, and, and the tools, etc., I mean, where is the best place to kind of connect with you? Uh, like, obviously, we've got our website. Which we've, is uh, benauthor.com. Benauthor.com. We're just working on a new website, which obviously will change the web address, but it'll all get directed into the same place. So if you type in at us, you should find us. That's going to be benandloisauthor.com. Um, we've also got our own YouTube channel, which I think is Ben Orford Media, if I remember correctly. So we've got quite a lot of sharpening videos and sort of top tips and sort of free advice on how to carve a spoon safely and things like that. So uh, you should be able to find us through that. You can also follow us on Instagram if you want to see what we're doing in the workshop. So that's quite good fun for, for me. I can take pictures on my phone and, and show you what I'm making. So that's quite good fun. And follow us on Facebook as well. So yeah, yeah Instagram something I like Instagram. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do guys, I want to put the links to all of the link, uh, the uh, URLs that uh, Ben just mentioned uh, and please, please, please connect with him. He really does just put out some great stuff, just a great guy uh, to speak to and I'm sure you like what he's doing regardless of where you are in the world. I know there's a lot of you guys based, based out in the States, and, you know, North America, Australia, etc. Um, so please check him out. So Ben, thank you once again Not a problem. for taking the time out. So Anytime. guys, uh, thank you for taking the time out to watch this video. Please go and support Ben. I'll put the links below. So until the next video, I hope whatever you're doing, you have an awesome day. And until next time, this is Zez from Zed Outdoors. Peace out.